Hello. Hello. Just checking if you're capable of hearing me. Yes, I can. Perfect. Can you okay. hear me too? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm trying to open the chat box uh, here. Uh, uh, okay, but you would see it if I do that. Uh, I just want to make sure if we can share your screen. Yes, uh, just a minute. Uh, share screen here, here. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, perfect. Okay, and can you see my face? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay, so I can put it like this and maybe add here. Uh, 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 what can I add? The chat box uh, here. So I, I have the chat box as well, so I can answer Perfect. questions if necessary. Okay. Uh, so I don't I don't have to share the image of my face on the on the video. You have it. It's up to you completely. If you would like to keep it, we don't have. We oh, yeah, it, we have it. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I, okay. Okay. So I'm gonna quickly introduce you and then give you um, give you the floor. So back in Nancy a few years ago, I was uh, lucky to meet Frank. Who is currently who is the CEO of Virtualis? He's a physiotherapist by education, and he's an expert in vestibular rehabilitation. So thank you for giving us this lecture, and I give you the mic. Thank you. Hank, you can start. I don't know if you can hear me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's start. Well, uh, first of all, thank you to everyone for being here today, attending this uh, meeting. I hope you're. Uh, all safe at home and that uh, this uh, crisis didn't hit too hard the way you are. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank Dr. Sino and Dr. Alfargal and all the Audiology Vestibular Science Forum for inviting me to talk to you today about virtual reality for vestibular rehabilitation. So it will be more about sharing my experience as a vestibular physical therapist uh, I've been using VR for uh, almost five years now. So I will explain in just a few words what uh, VR, uh, virtual reality, is actually. And then uh, we'll talk about what we can do for our patients uh, using VR for uh, the vestibular rehabilitation. So if you have any questions, you can uh, put them in the chat box. And uh, I will try, especially at the end, to have uh, at least 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes to be able to answer to all your questions. Okay, let's start. So uh, about VR, uh, everything's recorded, so you'll be able to have it in details after. The, the two keywords are really immersion and presence. It means uh, when you look at the paper's literature, uh, you will find a lot of publications about VR, but it's not actually real VR. It's uh, the Microsoft Kinect or the Nintendo Wii. In VR, you need to feel that you're yourself, you are in the environment and you are interacting with the environment. Uh, with the Kinect or the, the Wii balance board, you see an avatar reproducing your movements. So it's not really VR, it's feedback. It's a different technology. Uh, it uses more the mirror image of you see yourself doing something as an avatar. In VR, you actually feel you're in the environment and you're moving, acting, and looking at what's uh, happening around you. So there are two different technologies for actual VR. The cave, as you see, it's a little bit difficult to bring that to your everyday practice. So let's skip. And now we have head-mounted displays, such as this one, but there's a lot of different uh, HMD now uh, on the market. 
So now why should we use VR for vestibular rehabilitation? First of all, in everyday practice, are we really talking about vestibular rehabilitation or multisensory rehabilitation? In my experience, in my practice, I had just a few patients having an actual vestibular condition. Uh, BPPV, of course, you see them a lot, but you don't see them for a lot of sessions, usually two, three sessions. So it's not my everyday, everyday patients. Uh, you have a few neuronitis, uh, but not that much, and uh, many years disease as well, but not that much again. Usually most of the patients uh, we have in our practices are about visual dependence, visually induced vertigo, my vestibular migraine, PPPD, motion intolerance, motion sickness, sensory disorganization, uh, dizziness, risk of falls, unsteadiness, fear of heights, uh, motorist disorientation syndrome, patients who can't drive on the highway anymore, spatial disorientation, feeling uncomfortable in a crowd in a supermarket. So that was most of my patients had absolutely normal uh, vestibular assessment, but still felt dizzy uh, or unsteady or all that kind of symptoms. So it's more about multisensory rehabilitation really. And VR allows many sensory stimulations, minimizing of course the installation const constraints. It means you don't need a lot to have a lot of space, uh, a large room, just two meters and two meters are really enough. You can control the environment. You don't have to have a dark room for optokinetics or a subjective visual vertical. You can use everywhere you want in your practice. So it really changes the life of the vestibular PT to be able to work with really good conditions anywhere. So we have stimulations, vestibular stimulations, of course, with the head movements. We have audio, we have proprioceptions, vision, and we can create almost real movements. Uh, gait, of course, you can make the patient walk and have multitask. Uh, we know for risk of falling, usually they occur falls, I mean, uh, while doing multitask, while trying to grab something that's on the cupboard or anything. So with VR and the controllers now, we can use the upper limbs as well and be close to everyday life conditions. So that's the point here. We have with VR realistic simulations. It means the transposition into everyday life will be better. Of course, if you are very close to what the patient complains about, like being in a supermarket, if you just project white dots, like with a disco ball, the optokinetics on a dark wall, Will it work as well as if you put the patient in the actual virtual supermarket with the, the sound, with people, with the products to grab, to put in, the, in your basket? So we believe, and there are proofs now showing that the more realistic, the, more, the closer you are while uh, rehabilitating your patients, the better it will transpose to everyday life. That's the key thing about VR. So, for example, crowd, supermarket, street, subway, escalator. There's uh, quite a lot of publications now about the interest of VR uh, for vestibular rehabilitation. So I, I picked just a few. You have here uh, vestibular rehabilitation for Meniere's disease and conclusion, body balance, rehabilitation with VR, stimulations, effectively improved symptoms of dizziness, quality of life, that's very important and stability limits of patients with Meniere's disease. Another one here, 2016, about, uh, again, Meniere's disease. Uh, VR, vestibular rehabilitation, may be useful in patients with Meniere's disease, particularly those in the early stages or having mild functional disability. Another white paper about VR by, by Sue Whitney. I'm sure you know about her. Uh, conclusion, VAR is a promising treatment modality for persons with vestibular disorders. So at the beginning, we were trying to, to show that all the interest of VR for vestibular rehabilitation, but now there's quite a few publications with real VR, I mean head-mounted displays, uh, showing the, the impact uh, on vestibular rehabilitation. 
So the question was after, what can we do exactly? What can we make better than it was with VR? For the first idea was to work on the existing tools we use in France, uh, a lot of optokinetic stimulations. So the idea was to reproduce these optokinetic stimulations, but we don't have to have a dark room or specific circular walls or anything. It's a pure stimulation. It means your whole field of view is turning or moving. So the vection, the, the feeling of actual movement comes a lot faster and better, stronger. We have realistic environments. So a 3D scenery moving reproduces the ph uh, physiology of the optokinetic nystagmus. The optokinetic nystagmus is while you're watching uh, while you're in a train, for example, you're watching by the window and you're seeing a 3D scenery moving. And of course, you can s you have all these settings to control the, um, the power of your stimulation. So that's just an uh, example of what we can show inside the head-mounted display. So this is optokinetic stimulations. I will... I don't have that much time, so I'll make it so you see different environments. You can have a fixed dot. You can decrease like this. It's very important for patients uh, who can't stand it with real motion intolerance. You can start very easily by showing just a little bit like this and then progressively make it appear session after session. Uh, other kind of stimulations, realistic environments. So again, for a even feeling good while looking at that, it's a lot better to have it with the sun than to be in a dark room. Uh, we are working on uh, optokinetic observation and gain calculation in real time. Uh, so that's infrared cameras inside the VR goggles that will be able to show you the uh, gain of the optokinetic nystagmus in real time. Because at the moment when we do uh, of tokinetic stimulations, we look more at the postural response and reaction of your of the patients, but we don't know if we go too far, uh, too fast, too slow, if it's better like circular or vertical, uh, because we don't have access to these data of the optokinetic gain nystagmus in real time. So hopefully it will come in uh, 2021. I think we will see uh, maybe pathologies of the optokinetic nystagmus. So optokinetic is used mostly for uh, um, PPPD, for visual dependence and motion intolerance. So the other idea, uh, enhancing existing tools, was to bring the patient in optimum conditions for all the examinations we can do, such as uh, SVV, the subjective visual vertical, and rod and frame test, and the CTSIB, the CATSIB, for visual dependence measure. So that's a very old uh, prototype of uh, head-mounted display. But you see here the, the subjective visual vertical, the patient have just a Xbox controller and control the orientation of the rod. But you can see on the lower left corner here, we have as well the orientation of the head of the patient. So we can measure the orientation of his perception of verticality, but also the way he puts his head. You can have your own protocol. The same with dynamic SVV with optokinetic uh, dots behind. For assessments, rod and frame test. So this is the original rod and frame test. The head of the patient is supposed to be here with the chin here. So you see you have actually your head inside a cube one meter long with all 3D and all your field of view is tilted 18 degrees on the left and you have to orientate the, the bar. It's a measure for the field dependence. It's a kind of static uh, visual dependence. So it became just a square on it on the monitor screen. It's very different to having the whole the whole field of view tilted. 